This outfit never seems to lay correctly. I don't... Never mind. It's fine. It's fine. We'll fix it in post. So earlier this year I did a video where I ranked every game I played from 2019 from best to worst, and apparently some people watched it, which is pretty great. But it got me to thinking about some other years, and especially years that had great game libraries, practically, that came out. Originally, I was thinking about doing 2018, because a lot of games that I would have liked to put on the 2019 list actually came out the year before. But then I realized that in these very challenging and difficult times that we are all going through, I should probably look at older games, ones that might be on deep sale right now, ones that you may have missed because they just went by the wayside and then you never thought to pick them back up. And what better year to talk about than 2015, which was just chock full of games. So that's what we're doing on this episode. Here is every game I played from 2015 ranked from best to worst. Number one is really not going to surprise anyone because I've already talked about it. It's Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. It is one of the best RPGs of this generation. CD Projekt Red really put their heart and soul into this, maybe more than they really needed to, but it, we're not going to talk about that right now. It's not just the main game. It's all of the side quests and, and the sub-quests that you go through. It's all of these storylines that are beyond the main mission. It's Gwent, honestly. It's not just fetch quests uh, or, you know, go to A to get to B, those sort of missions that you see in a lot of RPGs to pad out runtime. No, these are full-fledged stories that they were building in Witcher 3. And then, if you get the complete edition, which should be very easy to find right about now, you can get some amazing add-on content like Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine, which by itself is practically a game. Fantastic title, definitely should play it, and if you did play it, it, you might consider going back and playing it again, because who doesn't want to get wrapped up in that glorious and very dangerous fantasy world? Although I can say that Witcher 3 was the best game, the one that I played the most was Fallout 4. I know a lot of people are going to say, well, Nathan, it wasn't really as good as some of the other Fallout games, and I know that's a matter of opinion. I get that, like, it was coming off of New Vegas being the last entry, and that's a hard act to follow. But 4 did a lot of interesting things. I liked the idea of having base building. If you liked Minecraft, they put some Minecraft in there. Being able to mod weapons. They lost weapon degradation. They changed up the uh, critical system. Uh, I liked how they dealt with special and special stats in 4. And the best part, of course, was mod support, which just extended the life of the game and uh, everything that you could do in it. I can't say that the story is as rich or good as other games that I'm talking about on this list, but in terms of just having fun and enjoying what the game has to offer, Fallout 4 is still incredibly addictive, and the add-on stuff is great too, especially Automatron, where you get to actually build robots. That's just, that's great. I can't exactly say that I'm a Metal Gear stan. You know, some entries I got more invested in than others, but I can tell you that Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain was, for me, the pinnacle of the series. They adopted this open world, which can be fraught with disaster, and yet they did such a good job. You got to have the Metal Gear experience while having that open world setting. And it worked. There was just a ton of fun to be had in the game. Uh, there's some wacky stuff going on. There's some really strange, surreal stuff going on. But again, it's Metal Gear. What did you expect? And I have to say that if this is where the series had to end, I think it really ended on a high note. Get, it. Get out here. This is where the series ended, and it went out on a high note. There's been a lot of zombie games that I did not enjoy. Uh, recently, I went back and tried replaying Dead Island, and I didn't really enjoy it uh, like I didn't enjoy it the first time. But ironically, Techland also made another zombie game that I really did like, and that's the next game on the list. It's Dying Light, and I'm really looking forward to Dying Light 2, by the way, because it looks to be even more ambitious than this. 
everything that was wrong with Dead Island was right in Dying Light. Uh, the light-dark mechanics where you go basically from predator to prey uh, just because of the time of day in-game is brilliant. It changes up the gameplay in a natural, organic way uh, that works tremendously well. I like the parkour elements. Being able to have more verticality in your levels was great. Uh, I loved being able to manipulate the environment to your advantage, creating uh, sound and, and light to try and, you know, uh, distract your enemies, uh, pitting, uh, you know, the mercenaries against the zombies and stuff so that you could sneak in around them. They added a lot of great stuff into this series, and I really hope it's the one that they get to uh, promote into the future because it was a great idea and it was executed beautifully. So Borderlands the Handsome Collection, all I really have to say is it's it's Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel. I, I had to put it pretty high on this list because if you've ever played either of those games, you should know that I'm going to have a certain affinity towards them. A Borderlands game, no, there's two. And oh, it's all the add-on content too? That's terrific. There was a lot for two. If you've never played the Borderlands series, I definitely suggest getting the Handsome Collection because you're going to get more Borderlands than you ever knew you wanted. Uh, but you will definitely appreciate the looter shooter more by experiencing the world of Pandora, and Elpis for that matter. Rare Replay is a collection of like 30 rare games. And they're not all winners, granted, but there are some real standouts in there. Uh, if you liked Conquer, they got the Conquer. If you liked The Perfect Dark, they got the Perfect Dark. And of course, they got all the Banjo-Kazooies. They got all the Banjo-Kazooies in there, so right there, you should be all set. This is a good deal just for that. It's also interesting to see the history of Rare through this collection, because you get to see their early arcade stuff, uh, and then you get to see what happens with their transition from going to be a, a Nintendo-supported company to being a uh, Microsoft-supported company, and seeing what happens in the Xbox era, which eh, wasn't great, to be honest with you. The problem, of course, is that there's notable exceptions in here. There's no GoldenEye, uh, there's no Donkey Kong 64, you know, some really great ones I would have liked to see, but of course they can't because of licensing issues. So it's not really a complete Rare collection, but there's enough goodness from the company when it was producing great games, which I, I can't really tell you it's doing so right now that it is worth the price of admission. Rise of the Tomb Raider is the second installment in the Survivor series, and it continues my love of this trilogy. I liked every installment. Rise of the Tomb Raider is sort of the, the uh, Empire Strikes Back uh, part of this whole thing, and it's ironic because it is actually in like a Siberian climate, so it kind of looks and feels like Hoth. Even if you're not necessarily into Tomb Raider, Lara Croft, and that whole mythology that's going on, you can appreciate the fact that the action-adventure gameplay is super solid in this one. There are real elements of Metroid and Zelda, but it works really well here. And if you haven't played some of these new games in the series, I highly recommend that you do. And there's a lot of nice challenge missions and some cool add-on content, too, that is worth exploring. Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition is reminiscent of the CRPGs, you know, your classic role-playing games, you know, top-down viewpoint with your party in tow, uh, having turn-based battles and everything like that. Uh, but they created these big, wide-open map sections, so you don't have a lot of transitions to go through. It had a great way of using the environment, both to your advantage and to your detriment, depending on how you're utilizing things. So there's oil on the ground. Well, if you put fire on that, uh, you know, now the whole floor is on fire. Oh, I need to douse out the flames. Well, now I've created a fog cloud. I can't see in the fog cloud. Those sort of active elements where the environment becomes part of the gameplay really sold me on this series and definitely made me want to experience it uh, more into the future. It's going to make me real interested to see what Larian does with Baldur's Gate 3. 
Life is Strange is a game that I just got around to playing, but it did come out in 2015. And I have to say that as far as narrative games go, it has a lot more meat on the bones than some of the Telltale games that I played. Every set piece, you actually get to walk around and experience it. It's not just a, a cutscene piece. Uh, so you do get to actually experience and navigate the world that you are in, even though it's in very small blocks. The way they use time manipulation and implement that into the storyline is very clever. And although it does have its shortcomings, especially when you get to the end and realize that it's back down to a basic A or B choice, it doesn't stop the fact that the, the narrative and the character development and the story really pulls you in and makes you want to play to the end and does make that last decision feel meaningful, if not for all the consequences that you had in the game, at least makes it feel meaningful to you as a player. Assassin's Creed Syndicate usually gets a bad rap, I think mostly because it was coming off of Unity, and so a lot of people kind of abandoned the series before they got to this. That's unfortunate, because I found Syndicate to be a blast to play. Uh, you get to be uh, Evie and Jacob Fry, and you're in Victorian London. Your hideout is on a train, and uh, being able to have like this underground gang uh, that's fighting other gang factions. There's just a lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, I felt like it got disservice because it was overlooked and it was kind of in this weird development period for uh, the AC series. But if you have not gotten a chance to play it, I highly recommend it. It is a lot of fun. It really is. It was, it was a better game than Unity. Unfortunately, Unity, I think, kind of sunk it for a lot of fans. Thea The Awakening is a game that I imagine a lot of people watching this video have never heard of before, and that's a real unfortunate thing. It was developed by a small dev house, an indie dev house. Uh, it was a turn-based strategy game about, like, Slavic mythology, and imagine civilization with supernatural elements, like giants and talking snakes and stuff. Are you in? Probably. The thing that's so addictive about this game, though, is that every individual villager, every individual character that you have in town, gets levels, has their own stats, and can be outfitted with their own equipment. So you'll spend countless hours just figuring out how to optimize each one of your characters for their strengths. Being able to have all these different ways to engage based on the strengths of your team. Every time you run through the game too, you get experience into the god that you were following, and that gives you bonuses when you go back in and play another game with that uh, god, and that's really cool too. If you're a fan of Civilization or any game like that, I Highly recommend trying Thea if you can get your hands on it. Saints Row Gat Out of Hell is somehow even more bonkers than Saints Row 4. I don't know how that's possible, but here we are. Uh, the storyline has the boss, you know, the character that you played in all the previous Saints Row games, getting dragged into hell because the devil wants them to marry uh, his daughter Jezebel. So Johnny Gat and Kinsey Kensington say, hey, we're going to go get the boss back. What follows is an absolute bonkers game. But the truth of the matter is, is that it doesn't have as much meat on the bones as Saints Row 4, because it essentially is a standalone expansion to that game. Still, it has enough of the flavor of Saints Row that you can enjoy it as part of the series. There's just not as much to it. Darksiders 2 Definitive Edition. They're getting real creative with these <laughs> special edition titles. Is the second installment in the Darksiders series, and obviously you play Death if you couldn't tell by that title. Out of all the Darksiders games, like 1, 2, and 3, I'd say 2 is actually the best. Uh, it took more of a Diablo-style uh, looting, you know, a color-coded rarity looting system. It felt far more expansive than the first one. I really appreciated that. Uh, you really spend a lot of time on horseback because the environment flared out and they wanted you to be able to see how large that landscape is. 
And I have to say that when you see how fast the gameplay is, death is surprisingly lively. I think that's ironic. Mad Max is an open world game where you play Mad Max. Since it is a desert wasteland, there does seem to be a bit of sparsity in this title that is unfortunate because when it gets good, it gets pretty good. Like, uh, being able to, like, upgrade and, and customize your vehicle and the vehicle combat is especially nice. But it doesn't necessarily feel as rich or fleshed out as some other games that are in that open-world GTA style. And so I, I give it props for doing a good job with a licensed property, but I've seen better examples of game tie-ins to licensed properties than this. Uh, the driving is pretty satisfying, though. The driving combat, especially, is pretty satisfying. Wolfenstein The Old Blood is sort of like a, a mini game, like a smaller game in the New Order, New Colossus realm. This actually came right after New Order, but before New Colossus. It still had the, the Wolfenstein appeal to it, but I again, I wouldn't really say that it had as much meat on the bones. It's pretty much level to level to level to level, and then you're done. So... Uh, it, it's not as long and it's not as deep as some of the other games, and they don't flesh out the storyline as well as they did in some of the other titles, but it still did give you that Wolfenstein feel, and I really did like the other installments in the series and the narrative that they built. So this is uh, definitely one to check out if you liked those other games. I can't necessarily say that it stands on its own, though. Wasteland 2 Director's Cut kind of feels like old-school Fallout. You know, it definitely has the look and the feel and the gameplay of the original, like, Fallout 1 and 2. That's not necessarily a bad thing at all. That top-down display, uh, seeing your characters getting into the turn-based combat, is pretty good. You know, they do a, a pretty good job with this title. And you'd be surprised how enjoyable it is is, even though it feels kind of rudimentary and kind of old school by comparison. If you like post-apocalyptic settings for RPGs, Wasteland at least shows you that Fallout is not the only game in town. The, uh, the remaster they did of the first Wasteland wasn't good, uh, but Wasteland 3 looks pretty great, so looking forward to that. Knights of Pen and Paper 2 is a novel approach to a turn-based RPG where you are playing the players, playing their characters, sitting at the table, uh, going through like a traditional pen and paper RPG. It's very clever. It's very well done. There's a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor involved, but it actually works very well. I played this right after I played the original Knights of Pen and Paper, and this was very recent, mind you. And I actually have to say that I, I may have liked the, the first one a little bit more, but that doesn't stop this one from being just, it puts a smile on your face, and it's very enjoyable. Reminds you a little bit of, like, the old Dragon Quest games, but a little bit more of a meta-commentary version of that. People may get a little bit upset with me, especially because it's this far down on the list, but Ori and the Blind Forest is an interesting, gorgeous to look at, mind you. Just, I, I want to put that right out there. The production value of Ori and the Blind Forest is excellent. However, the gameplay is frustrating, and that's really why it's so far down on this list. Uh, because if I'm not enjoying playing the game, there's not a lot else I can do with it. I did really appreciate the world building to this. There's actually a lot of really good stuff in it. And I recently played Will of the Wisps too, and and I had a similar problem with it. It's like it, yeah, you you've built this beautiful uh sweeping world that feels very cinematic. But then I start playing it and some of the platforming elements are just insane to the point where I don't even want to engage with it anymore, and it seems to happen pretty fast. Uh, so that's the reason why I couldn't give it more credit than this. If you like challenging platformers, though, this is that, and you are going to enjoy that. I, however, didn't. Just Cause 3 is basically the same as every other Just Cause game, but you know what? I, I appreciate it for that. 
create a bunch of chaos and mayhem, uh, destroy everything, blow everything up, giant explosions, parasailing through the air, and, and, and ziplining through lush environments. I mean, it's every Just Cause game, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. It's super fun and enjoyable while you're playing it. And it's kind of insane. It's just not necessarily anything more or less than the other games in the series. So if you played any of the other games in the series, I don't really know if this added a lot to the formula. Technically, the first episode was released in 2014, but the rest of Tales from the Borderlands was released in 2015, so I'm counting it as a 2015 game because it didn't get finished until then. It's a, a Telltale series. I think they did the look and the feel of the series right the characters were brand new characters for the most part, and you did engage with them. But of course, the one problem that you have with a lot of the Telltale series is that whatever you were playing those initial games for, like Minecraft is, is another good example, whatever you were playing those games for in their original format is not present here, because now it's a narrative-focused game. Some titles translate better to that than others. I don't really think the frenetic looter shooter that is Borderlands translates particularly well to a narrative format. But, I mean, I did still finish it. I played through all five episodes, and so I must have been enjoying it to some degree. Ironically, Forza Horizon 2 Presents Fast and Furious was the first Horizon game I played. And for some reason, it didn't really grab me like other installments in the series eventually would. Maybe it's just because when you think about the Horizon series, it's these big, expansive landscapes that you really get to just drive around and explore. It feels like these big, open spaces you really get to just drive around in with reckless abandon. And, and the Fast and Furious, like, standalone piece that they made just didn't feel as much like that as the other installments in the series. You know, it just didn't have as big a scope or feeling to it. And I, I like the Fast and Furious movies, and I like Horizon. For some reason, the two together just didn't work for me. I don't really even understand that, but I, I, I just did not get into it. Some people may think that I'm an Obsidian stan, and yes, I do like a lot of their games, but I think this next entry will prove that that is not always the case. Pillars of Eternity is the same kind of, like, CRPG that I was talking about with Wasteland 2 or uh, Divinity Original Sin, right? But it's really not as good. I wish it was. It's not that there isn't enough content to it, but one... The story doesn't really grab you. There's a lot of just vague text blocks uh, where people are uh, espousing upon things. There's a lot of exposition in this. Um, but the big thing that kills me is that there's so many areas, uh, little areas, fairly small areas, and there's transition screens between them. And, and the loading screens between each one of these is just exorbitant. So if you have to go from point A to point B in any of these missions, which uh, most of the time they ask you to do that, what you end up doing is spending the majority of your time going through individual load screens. Oh, and then I just walk to this next thing and I get another load screen. Oh, and I walk right here and I have another load screen. Oh, and, and another load screen. It just breaks up the flow of the game completely. It's not something that I experienced in those other games that I was talking about because they loaded in these very large areas that you could explore. But I still got to play a monk, so... I mean, there was that, credit where credit is due, but honestly, I do not understand why that experience couldn't have been streamlined. Batman Arkham Knight is, quite honestly, the worst of the Arkham franchise. They just went all in on the open world, and I kind of like the claustrophobic nature of the original Arkham Asylum. Then they went to Arkham City, and they started doing the bigger open world format, and I was like, eh, all right, this is fine. It, I, I don't necessarily like it as much, but it's fine. Then they get to Arkham Knight, and literally, you're, you're just driving around in the Batmobile for a large portion of this, because it's just city street after city 
city street and there's all kinds of riddler challenges about how you can drive through these sections and stuff and they just they went full throttle into a version of the series i'd prefer they didn't go into and uh i don't necessarily think that it worked Fallout Shelter was an interesting mobile game. It came right from Bethesda. It was sort of a lead-up to Fallout 4. They announced it at E3, and it was available that day. And it was a neat idea being able to design your own vault and, you know, attract new vault dwellers. That was a cool idea. The thing that really lost me was when they started updating the game to try and give it, I guess, a little bit more meat on the bones... There were things like uh, going out on missions and taking your, your troop out there, and then you have to like individually go through every single room in each one of these, essentially, dungeons. Those sort of aspects of the game really dragged down the whole experience and um, didn't feel quick like you would hope a mobile game would be. I'm not the kind of person that just poo-poos mobile games altogether. I'm going to be talking about a few more right now. But when they're good... They can be a real enjoyable diversion. When they're bad, they just feel like a waste of your time. Fallout Shelter felt really substantial when it originally came out, like a really fun experience to have, and then just got bogged down so much in the minutia. The best thing I can say about Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time is that if you are playing with like two to four people, this is probably a great experience, a fun party game that everyone can enjoy. It's fun for the whole family. If you are, however, playing as a single player like me, this is just annoying because you can only do one thing at a time and then you have to move your character around. So for instance, okay, so I, I, I can steer the ship, right, but I can't... Uh, access my shields or my weapons or anything like that. In order to do that, I gotta I gotta leave my control station, and I gotta go to another station to control the the little gun thing. If this was just like a, a space shooter game, I think I would have enjoyed it a whole lot more. But this was obviously a game built specifically for multiplayer, it, to the point where I don't really even know why they had a single player version. Angry Birds 2 is the sequel to Birdemic. No. It, it's the sequel to Angry Birds, obviously, but I didn't really engage with it as much as I did with the original Angry Birds. If you don't remember Angry Birds, let me just explain to you that it was a game where you chucked birds into these building structures that pigs made because they stole a bunch of eggs and the birds want to get them back. And it's also a whole lot of fun, just slinging birds and using the physics engine to see if you can topple off all of the pigs and knock them out. The sequel just didn't feel as original or interesting as the first one did. It didn't do enough new stuff to justify its existence, in my opinion. Uh, they did eventually have, like, Angry Birds Space and, and the Star Wars one where they experienced w more with gravitational wells and such. But this one, it made some quality of life improvements, but not enough to really justify me playing it for any period of time. Battlefield Hardline is a Battlefield game. It's a first-person shooter. It plays like every other Battlefield game. The difference here is that you get to play the, the cops going and busting up dr uh, drug rings, was it? it? Some kind of criminal organizations. Uh, and then there's these, uh, your partner ends up being like corrupt in the first five minutes and there's your story and now go shoot a bunch of things. And frankly, uh, I don't know, man. You know, I, I don't know what else to say. Battlefield, Call of Duty, these are like first-person shooter games where I go from one level to the next level to the next level, and then we're done, and then you try to just shoot everything imaginable. And I've never really engaged much with them. I, I can't remember one installment from the next very easily. At least I remembered what the theme of this one was, so I'll give it credit for that, but I, I've never engaged with these games or these series. There was a lot of talk about Project Cars when it first came out because it was, you know, supposed to be this new series that was uh, had a bunch of licensed cars in it and was trying to be a more maybe realistic racing game. But, you know, I've seen plenty of realistic racing series and I've never liked them as much as the arcade series. 
And there wasn't really much in terms of progression. You know, if you just want your Lamborghini in Project Cars, you just go and get it. That's kind of neat, but I did like the idea of, you know, being able to build up equity and buy these things because it made me feel like it was making progression. Project Cars basically just gives you everything out of the gate and says, go wild, now let's do some racing. I would much prefer my arcade racers to this anyway. Give me a Forza Horizon, give me a Burnout, give me a Need for Speed. I don't want to be realistic with my racing. I want to feel the feeling of what I imagine I feel with racing, so. Star Wars Uprising was a mobile game that was trying to be kind of like a top-down action shooter title. It's no longer available, so don't worry too much about it. it. It had its moments, and I did play it for a good while before the server shut down, but it was very rudimentary in its shooting action, and there are much better examples of, like, your top-down uh, you know, twin-stick shooter kind of thing that we can get into at another time. But, uh, yeah, it was a neat experiment. But Star Wars games, again, kind of hit or miss. Victor Vran was trying to be Diablo, but maybe more of, like, a hardcore Diablo. Like, uh, imagine if, like, uh, Diablo and uh, Dark Souls had a baby. I could tell you that I pretty much just played it for about 10 minutes. So I really should not judge the entire experience because I kinda got bored and didn't care after a very short period of time, didn't really engage with the characters, thought that it felt very generic at the outset, and I just put it down immediately. So that might be a failing on my part, but you know what? The game has to sell itself to me, and Victor Brand didn't do that. When I did my uh, Most Forgettable Games of the Decade video, which you should definitely check out because it's the kind of list no one else did, Evolve was my game for 2015, and I think the real reason why it was my game for 2015 was because nothing really happened in it. The problem with Evolve is that it is completely dependent on how much players put into it. It's only multiplayer, there really is no single player experience to speak of, and so if the players are not engaging and the players are not there, there is no game. There were no players, therefore there is no game. The Escapists. I... I don't get it. Let me put it to you that way, I just, I don't, I don't get the appeal. I didn't understand the interface. Uh, I, I didn't understand how I was doing anything. Uh, I got uh, bored because I wasn't really making any progress. And I gave up. Yeah. So, as some people may know, I've played basically every Assassin's Creed game that I can possibly think of. The Chronicles series is basically a 2D side-scrolling stealth game. And I'll just save you the trouble of really looking it up. None of them work. They really don't. The one that came out this year was uh, Assassin's Creed China that puts you in the shoes of Xiao Jun. And I think that's actually the thing that I was uh, most sad about because Xiao Jun deserves a much better game. A is Xiao Jun really deserves a full release Assassin's Creed title, especially when you understand how important she is to the Brotherhood and how her story kind of intersects with Ezio Auditori and, and like how her name even ends up coming up in like Assassin's Creed 3 because Connor Kenway uh, gets uh, stuff that she built. So it's really disappointing that she got relegated to this crap. Hopefully she'll get better treatment in the future of the series, I'm hoping. And at the very bottom of the list is Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5. Um, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really remember a ton about uh, 5. I can tell you that uh, when Tony Hawk is good, it's good. Remember uh, Pro Skater 2 and, and 4 and Underground? Remember, remember those? 5 was not that. 5 is notoriously bad, to the point where I think I blocked out most of my memories of it. Uh, I actually had to be reminded by a whole bunch of people telling me that it was bad. Uh, to remember that, oh yeah, that was a disappointing installment in the series. A series that deserved a lot better treatment. I would love to see the return of Tony Hawk, don't get me wrong. I would love to see a new pro skater today. 
uh, with the level of technology and, and, and the physics engines that they have today. Oh, man, that would be terrific. But please don't model it on five. <laughs> yes! The prophecy has been fulfilled. Oh, September can't come fast enough. Okay, I think that's everything. Uh, so yeah, that's every game I played from 2015 ranked from best to worst. And um, hey, you know what? Hopefully you heard about at least a few games that you were not aware of before. Some of them still might be available. Maybe not the mobile games, but some of them are. And hey, if you end up playing any of those because you watched this video, please let me know. I would be very interested to find out if literally anything I just recorded mattered in the slightest. But as always, do not forget to dislike and unsubscribe, because uh, we, we are the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5 of the internet. That's a terrible tagline. Don't put that on screen. No. Don't. Please don't. Should've known that was coming. So there's this one piece of add-on content in Rise of the Tomb Raider that I think is really interesting where you get to go back to Croft Manor, a, a very run-down, fixer-upper version of Croft Manor because she's been away for a long time and there's been some damage. It has not had any upkeep, really. But her uncle wants Croft Manor, is trying to make the case that he is the legal owner. And so Laura is going through the house to find clues that prove that she is the rightful heir. But when you're going through the manor and you're seeing what terrible condition it's in, you ask why anyone would really want it that badly. Like, did she really want it that badly? If she did, why wouldn't she have been fixing this place up? Like, literally, there's a giant hole in the roof in the main hall, and there's water pouring in on, on the main hall floor. Like, there are roots... And trees, there's like trees just growing through windows. Did no one hire a gardener? Did none of this occur to her during that time? No, it's just like, I didn't take care of it when I had it, but now that somebody wants to take it away, I have to prove that this fixer-upper of a mansion that is going to take who knows how much money to fix is totally mine. You could have had real property value. You got to keep up with your property care. You had the money. You had the Croft fortune. It's not like you can't. Shattered windows and, and giant holes in the roof do not constitute open concept. There is not a real estate agent in the world that can sell people on that. Sorry.